a girl a running in a group. She had a high speed motor in a 44 coupe. She had a racing cam and a supercharge. Look at Buddy Hotter, Hotter, Large. She's a hot rod. She's a hot rod. Yeah. Do you think this is going too fast? Do you think this these recalls? Do you think that's the cause of all these recalls? Going, and they're just they're going too too much too fast. Well, uh, okay, so this becomes an interesting question about you, you know what I, you know what I think of when you mention this. I think of the Titanic. So here's why you know the story of the Titanic, the whole thing about the lifeboats and all the stuff. It's like well, we had enough lifeboats. We because the government said here's how many lifeboats you need to have. Not enough for all the people, but we had enough lifeboats according to the government. So I, I wonder if, you know, imagine you have a car that can go, you know, nearly 200 miles an hour. Are you doing 200 mile an hour crash tests or are you doing the minimum government standard crash tests? Right. And so that becomes the question is like, you know, if I'm in a race car, it has wildly different safety mechanisms than a standard American vehicle does. Well, when you have a, when you have a couple of states... And a president telling you that by X amount of time, you're going to have to have all electric vehicles. Right. And those require all this development and all this research and data. Right. And if you don't do it fast enough. Well, but so that becomes the question. I mean, like even, you know, your story earlier about fire safety. You know, obviously, well, who's, whose car, what, what car blew up all the time? But they, they claimed it blew up, but it didn't really, what am I thinking of? The uh, the Pinto? The, the, like the Pinto. So, like, this was a known, I, I was watching a document. Like they a, did, too. They blew up. Well, but it was, an, it was a known issue that they kind of avoided for far too long, right? So it's kind oh, of like, absolutely. we knew that it was a absolutely. design flaw. We didn't do anything about it. People died. And then we went back and we went, oh, yeah, we that, should have done something about that. That car would explode if you backed into a fire plug, pull it out of your driveway. Well, and so that becomes your question about, about, you know, even electric vehicles is the risk of fire is probably. So you have an interesting problem is that if my regular vehicle catches fire, my door should still work. If my electric vehicle catches fire, is it possible that the locks will engage and I'll have to find a way to break the I mean, I, I you know. I think I've told you the story. I've, I've flipped the car before. It wasn't my fault. It was somebody else's. It was, it was the road's fault. It wasn't my fault. Okay. But the car flipped and I had to kick my window out to get out because, there, you know, I had to break the window. But I mean, you know, it was, it worked out that I found myself in a position where I could kick the window out and luckily the car didn't catch fire. Oh, absolutely lucky. I mean, that's the thing is like, you know, that, that could have been a vastly different situation. So people are like, I'm amazed you're alive. Well, they have they have safety devices for a car that flips. I mean, they have one way valves in the tank, for well, gas tank and stuff. Right, but for you gas. put a rupture in the tank, and that would there's no saving that. Right, but I'm saying we have safety mechanisms to prevent a, a con- combustion vehicle from catching fire. But do we have the same safety mechanisms on an electric vehicle? Well, that they have to do this, but that that's but see that's something they're going to do. That's extra. The safety is later. We got to get these cars on the road. We got to hurry well, up and develop the software and get these cars on right, the road. But we'll worry about people dying later. Right. So, but my point was, like, you know, my point earlier was, you know, the government has a set of standards. And a lot of times what happens is the government standards fall behind the vehicle. So, again, you have a vehicle that can go 200 miles an hour. Fall can it survive times. a 200 mile yes. an hour crash? So, this is kind of my point is that, you know, by the time the government figures out what they want to do, I mean, we'd much rather them not hold back progress, but also it's kind of like, oh, by the way, a number of people are going to die in fires. And they go, oh, well, maybe you should have a safety mechanism for that. And that'll be discussed well, after I, people assu- have died. I'm assuming that this, this woman, she probably didn't know it was on fire until it was too late. Just all the lights blinking and everything scared her, I'm sure. Well, okay, so She now- had a lot of shortages going on. And, but as far as the fire, I think that probably snuck up on her. So, so again, is that something, would it make sense to have some sort of, I mean, obviously fire suppression system would be pretty expensive and it probably wouldn't work, uh, but like a fire detection system or something along those lines. I mean, like how, how expensive would it be to put a smoke detector in a car? I don't know. I mean, how like, about a light that says exit vehicle, right. get out. Well, basically there's a condition Come I on. don't know. Get out. Right. I mean, yeah. that's basically like exit vehicle, exit vehicle, get out. Right. Because I'm telling you this, we're going too fast too soon, too much. And 
it, it's being pushed down our throats and the manufacturer. The manufacturers are under as much pressure as the pe- American people right. to buy these cars and they, to buy them and to make them. Well, when we talked about, it, I mean, you know, you're, you're not, you can't retool on a dime, and they are making a, they are gambling on consumer demand and consumer demand based on government regulation. So, I mean, for years and years, it's always been we can our cars are going to be based on government regulations. Yeah, but nobody wants them. I'm telling you, you look at the it, the the reason that things are going differently now is because the the demand for electric cars, electric all electric vehicles, is starting to soften. Right, right. It, it was a great thing at first. Everybody that wanted one got one. Blah blah blah. It's really great. I'm sure the people that bought the original Teslas are kicking themselves in the rear end right now because they could have bought it for twenty thousand dollars cheaper because everybody's lowered their prices. Right. But you can't. But if you ask the people, do they want this electric car? No. They, they, and everybody says, well, I, I don't want to have to charge it. I don't I don't know if we're ever going to have enough electricity to charge it. And I don't like, I don't want the, the inconvenience of an electric car. The American people are very funny about being inconvenienced. And if you, why would you purposely go and buy something? If, say you're a traveling salesman and you have to go all around the Midwest. Why would you go and buy a car that you can only call on four customers a day, then you have to go and charge it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's just not convenient. It's well, not going to work. Well, and the other thing that was funny is I was thinking of you the other day. I was in downstate or <laughs> central Indiana. I'm sure uh, it was where, bad. He was thinking well, about Well, no, me. it was where all the windmills are. And they, oh. a, a, every time I was down there this weekend, I kept seeing truckloads of windmill parts leaving with an escort. Ten, ten internal combustion vehicles. P- police uh, vans trucks <laughs> 10 vehicles to haul one blade of a windmill oh yeah 10 internal combustion oh, vehicles yeah. all burning gas but so i mean that's the whole thing it's like well this is green once it gets there well, I get but it. they I, can't they well, can't build these things fast enough they're, no, they're bringing they parts in uh, by the train load and, and they're building these things as quick as they, they don't can. know what to do with them once they break they will wear out there's some out there's some out there that have been out there right. for 10 years well and that's the whole that's always been the question is you know, what is the return on investment of them? And some people have said the ROI on a windmill exceeds its useful life of like 25 or so years. Yes, it does. Um, so, I mean, and again, every time I'm out there, there's cranes out there, there's guys working, there's yeah. a constant. But so the, my, my thinking was, it's like they cannot they cannot build these fast enough because they know the demand well, for electricity is there. Well, right now, the big demand for electricity, it's going to get more. Right. And there's people that are making money off of these windmills, but it's temporary. They don't last. Right. And that's not going to be enough electricity, Chuck. Well, now we're seeing a lot of uh, social media discussion about bringing back the nuclear uh, power plants that we talked. We've talked about that. Oh, here. Yeah. There's they, a lot of people they have the mini ones that that uh, Buffett right. and, the, and Zuckerberg and what's his name? Uh, not Getty, but the guy, the other guy from. Well, anyway. Well, so but I mean, we haven't if I remember correctly, we haven't authorized a new nuclear power plant in. 50 years if i have my if i recall that or they couldn't finish build any they wouldn't approve new ones and stuff like that so i mean i don't think we've done we have not built another nuclear plant since chernobyl well since three mile island or whatever but, three mile island right. okay so, so i mean same idea though is that they basically you, you they haven't approved new ones and that probably needs to change and that is the only place you're going to get enough electricity right to run all these cars i, I had this i had not argument discussion this morning with somebody have over coffee at my shop and i said okay we live in lansing we're sitting in lansing Thirty thousand people live in lansing let's say conservatively it's fifteen thousand cars where are we going to get the electricity i don't care where your charger is it can be in your garage at home it can be out on the street in front of your house i don't care where are you going to get enough electricity to make that charger work for fifteen thousand cars that's a lot of electricity right no, I, I agree. There's a lot of logistics that need to be sorted out. And, and it's the problem is, going back to my original analogy, is government's going to come in on the back end when half the country is having brownouts and go, well, maybe we need to do something about yeah, this. Yeah, maybe we should and do in, something. And in 10 years, we'll build some new nukes to, to cover the electric. We'll, we'll, you know, we're not going to build new coal power plants. So it's kind of like, no. well, we'll approve some new nuclear power plants. Well, that's what and, China did. They built some coal-fired plants. Right. They're, building they, they one like a, they're building them every week or they something They don't care like about, the, about the environment. They could care less. But I'm saying that's never going to happen here. Yeah. And so now you have to find solutions after the brownouts start happening. Well, I tell you what, you don't know it's never going to happen here. 
let's just think about that a minute. When people get desperate and they can't get to work because they were forced to buy an electric car, right. and now they got no place to plug it in. Right. I mean, there could be coal-fired plants being built. Well, they're going to start burning something. I mean, oh yeah, I I probably would like to see natural gas because we got more of that than we know what to do with. Right. And natural gas burns clean. I don't know what anybody wants to tell you. Natural gas can burn clean with a minimum of adjustments. So yeah, it's not. <laughs> All right. Well, I've okay, had my a, the I, soapbox for that's my soapbox for that seg this segment. Because I have another one oh, here. there's more. Interfering autonomous cars irritate emergency responders. Now, there's a headlight, or a headline. Ooh, a headlight. As police and fire officials responded to a drug lab explosion in San Francisco, no. They had to contend with a driverless car that had meandered into the middle of the scene. It just drove right in. Body cam footage from February shows an officer yelling at the Waymo vehicle, he's yelling at this autonomous car, and tossing a flare to keep it from driving over their fire hoses. <laughs> yelling at an autonomous vehicle, I got a, that's just a, right out of the Three Stooges. Several weeks earlier, a firefighter reported having to smash the window of a driverless vehicle to make it stop approaching a fire scene. It's going to drive right into the fire with somebody in the back seat. Yeah. In March, firefighters said they had cordoned off a street to deal with wind damage, only to have two cruise vehicles, Chevy Cruises, drive through the warning tape and become entangled in downed wires. You would think that would be part of their program if you see yellow tape stop. Well, okay, but we, we've had this discussion. I mean, and I, apparently, again, now government's going to have to eventually have this discussion about how do you stop an autonomous vehicle. We've we talked about this a few weeks ago with the video of I don't think you do. Well, and that becomes the question is there should be a way that a police officer, he shouldn't have to light a flare or shoot his gun or break a window. He should or, reach in his pocket, pull out his phone and do, 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 and that car should stop. Well, maybe have some sort of device again, an either, app of some kind. Well, something yeah i mean either the vehicles have it or the person has it but then now i now i can go buy one of those on amazon and, and sit and play pranks on people and well cars that's the other and, thing you, you can't have that because you're going to have naughty people right so naughty people so yeah so again a, a lot of problems that need to be sorted out uh you know i think we we talked about the video the other day where the 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 person was in the car and the car was driving and she's yelling at the officer i'm we're not driving we can't do anything about it you know <laughs> You pull over. I'm not. I'm not. I'm the car's not drunk, officer. I'm not driving. First responders said the problem of driverless vehicles accidentally disrupting emergency scenes has gotten worse since companies have expanded their hours of testing. See, they're too much too fast again. The story said at least 15 fire department incident reports noted interference from Waymo or cruise vehicles. So <laughs> I just I just have this picture in my head of a, a policeman screaming at this Waymo vehicle and throwing a flare at it. Right. I mean, but even then, it's like, is it programmed to stop when you throw a flare at it? I mean, well, let them carry grenades then. you know, they got to do something to stop this car. Well. Well, the. And I, I could have told you this, but I, I'm just waiting till I saw it in black and white printed. It's for sure. It's not a guess. The NADA, that's the National Automotive Dealers Association, data, 2022, new car inventory is up, vehicle sales per dealership is down, and rightfully so. New car inventory rose in 2022, but the average number of new vehicles sold per dealership fell according to the NADA 2022 NADA data report issued in April new vehicle inventory reached 1.7 million at the end of this year that's good up more than 50 percent from the near historic low of 1.1 million at the start of 2022 the average number of new cars sold per dealership fell 8.5 percent to 819 from 895 the total sales are going down they're going down and i love it i gotta tell you and i'll tell you why chuck and i am not a 
I'm not a bad guy. I'm not a, a masochist, but I'm going to tell you like it is. These dealers, I understand, when the pandemic hit and blah, 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 they weren't selling any cars. Nobody could get out and around. If they did sell a car, they wanted to make as much as they could on that car to keep the lights on, keep the doors open, keep everything working. Even though they had a body shop and a, and a mechanic shop that was still working and, and, and putting money into the dealership. But they sold them for as, many, as much as they could get. And people just had to buy. They had to, people that had cars that no longer could be repaired. I've had, my God, in, in the first 35 years of my business, I didn't, have, I didn't have 20 of these. I have 20 a month now. Cars that just are done. They're up to 300,000 miles. The frame is rotten. Putting money into that car is not good. I tell people, don't do this. But now you got to go buy a car. And they go to buy a car and the dealer and the salesman says, well, this one's three grand over sticker. This one's 4,000 over the sticker. You know, you look at the sticker and just add four. You know what? Now we have the, we have the, we have the cars. It's over. The, the pandemic is over. The, the shortages are over. This man-made crap that went on. And they're still selling them for sticker or more. In 2021, they had the biggest year they ever had selling cars money-wise. Not the biggest money uh, years for selling cars car-wise, money-wise. Like $1.3 trillion or something in sales. I mean, it's insane. But they had it because they were taking advantage of people. Now, at first, I could understand it trying to keep the doors open, trying to keep the dealership afloat. They only had so many cars to sell. They wanted to get the most they could get out of every car. If you needed a car, they had you right by your toenails, and you were stuck, okay? So you paid it, and you they offered you 10, 10 years of financing, which the F&I guy really stuck it to you, I'm telling you right now. If, you've got a ten, if you have a 10-year or 7-year mortgage on your car, oh, my God. But they just, they did business unscrupulously, as far as I'm concerned. This is my opinion, not anybody else's. This has nothing to do with the radio stations, Gerard Media. Even Chuck doesn't have, doesn't have to stand behind this. I'm standing behind this. They did business unscrupulously, and they took advantage of people. And now, people are saying, no. Only the people that are desperate and have to have a car that is, and their car is unrepairable. Those people are buying, still buying cars. The people that ordinarily would say, well, my car is six years old. I want to get a new one. Or I got 150000 on it. It's still a good car. But I want to sell it and get a new one. Nobody's doing that. And that's the reason why is because these guys are stinkers. These salesmen are stink pots and they're selling this stuff and they're selling it above sticker and there's not a shortage of cars. The manufacturer is even doing what they call controlled inventory. And they got a whole big excuse for controlled inventory. It comes right down to it. That's to keep the cars on the lot less so that you have to buy what they have and you have to pay what they tell you. If, if their sales are down, good. That's all I got to say for them. If their sales are down, then good. Good. 